one might ask the question, how does race, gender, income, and education influence economics? How are poor communities formed? How is poor housing connected to health? How does overcrowding in communities impact health? What is poverty and how is it perpetuated? Who benefits from poverty? Why are people's conditions accepted to be norms? How did black people nationwide, worldwide lose their wealth? We hear what happened in Tulsa, but did you know communities nationwide were destroyed? We had airports, uh, cabs, uh, buses, a uh, hotel. We had a lot of stuff. And how did that fall off? I just have seen the steady decline of African American home ownership in the district. They used to call this Chocolate City, <laughs> but now most, a lot of the um, black people had to leave. Um, not saying some of them didn't maybe want to leave, but. But I know a lot of people that live in this neighborhood, they don't want to, they don't want to give up their home, but they uh, kind of like forced out. We've researched and found grave economic imbalances. In many cases, one's wealth determined one's health, from wages, appraisals, to zip codes, using eminent domain or intimidation to sell, to life insurance discrimination. And in that last case, health determines one's wealth. Communities east of the river struggled not only from being under resourced, but from ill conceived, unjust, and truly racist policies. A lot of people got their homes taken. They, they didn't really have to sell it, they got forfeited uh, by asset forfeiture. And if you had marijuana in your home, you lost, you lost your home. And if you had a boat, you lost your boat, your car, and they, and they just lost a lot and then they legalized <laughs> To understand the historic and the current real estate investment and the mere wealth and health of Blacks in DC with a great deal of clarity, you must chart the course of the housing equity. When they didn't have the money to get a decent place, they had to go into like drug infested areas, um, a lot of um, roaches and rats and running around with the small children and they could just couldn't do any better. Now when you have that lack of housing affordability you are kind of going to the lowest denominator of where you can afford to live and that inherently puts you in a terrible condition. The mental health issues that come out of poor housing condition it is traumatic on a slow beat that gets louder. I do believe there is a connection between uh, poor housing and unaffordable housing, mainly because uh, you have people who are, their mindset, wherever they may have been born or wherever their parents may have lived, is acceptable or adequate for them. Bad housing condition had become normalized. One of my closest friends and mentors throughout most of my career uh, working for uh, Green and Healthy Homes was Elijah Cummings. And Elijah grew up in a challenged neighborhood in West Baltimore. And he, he had asthma and he talked about the normalization for families. And I saw it myself when we would visit families and at the time in the, in the early 90s, mid 90s, Families could tell me their child's lead level and the name of the pediatrician treating them faster than they could tell me the name of their school, their kid's teacher or where they were going to preschool. And that troubled me greatly. So, you know, if you look at lead poisoning, right, we all, I think most people know it causes cognitive impairment uh, is the nice way to say it. Uh, the truth is it's brain damage, the deteriorated housing stock, and the impact on not only health of children and seniors and families, but a really equitable pathway. Build the houses for people to live in with good material, not shabby material. I know you're trying to save money, but all what they build around here, oh no. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a house, it's a house uh, by the cost to speak for me. Um, the daughter, one of the daughters wanted to uh, fix the house up, but the house was so in bad shape. 
until the uh, district told them that uh, they was gonna put a sign on it. Uh, if they didn't have a and sell it, they would they would um, lose it because it was in condemned shape. And they said that you couldn't sell it a condemned home. But um, they they got it they got it sold, so that was great. Before they slapped that condemned sign on it. So all of that lack of wealth and resources leads to something very simple lack of essential maintenance practices in housing. And then when that starts to crater, you get mold, you get mildew, you get pests, you get chipping blood paint, um, and you don't have the upgraded mechanicals uh, for weatherization. And, you know, it's literally the roof caves in. Uh, you know, I cannot tell you how many homes of widows that I've been in where there was no sort of economic base left. And so the houses just continue to deteriorate for older adults. They get moved to either public or private assisted living. And that opportunity for value in real estate, uh, for example, just goes away. And uh, we had one house in the neighborhood, the young man, the, they put the mother and father, they went in a nursing home and they just got a truck and told people to empty the whole house out in the truck. And um, it was a, it was a lot of antiques in that house too. And so so they could sell it, you know. And I mean, like in the area, the, the area of World One where I'm from is that was I've seen people like get off of that money. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but they not thinking, you know, money is to be spent. So when you get that, when that you sell that house. You get that money, then the money's gone, the house is gone, and then you in the pot. The new district became a mecca for the homeless for a period of time. Uh, correspondingly, at the same time, we had this just this this drug explosion, which introduced a crack cocaine uh, in our communities, and we saw uh, a couple of things occur. We, we saw the quality of life so adversely impacted from the use of, of these, these, these drugs that, that really were abusive to the human body. Uh, at the same time, we saw the, the, those that had the, the opportunity to leave, we saw a lot of our middle class folks leave D.C. in search of other, other places. It's, 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 it's scary for real, because I know that we like might have to go. Because I think I think in the district they have a lot of tactics to really get you out. I used to like um, tell some of my friends back when the change was first started, like um, hey, one not looking out the window and seeing the change, you know, and because it, it was it was gradual, it was something. But then the next thing you know, boom. I see this as having come about because of conscious and unconscious collusion on policy, right? Institutions start to overtake people and even good people institute things that are really unhelpful to communities. So that's one. The second is redlining by banks. You know, I still have neighbors that, uh, that come back in the neighborhood just to see what their house looks like now. And that's what I mean about like, struggles with us to just hold on and, these, and, these, and the white people just can come in, gut the house, fix the house up exactly how they want it. One of the challenges that we have among our communities is that sometimes uh, the cost of money to people of color is different from other communities. Oftentimes the amount that we can put down is different because we don't have that generational wealth that a parent or an uncle or relative can give you as a down payment. And I look at that as a, as, as a, as some of the systemic racism and, a, and, a, and then I also look at it as opportunities that we miss. The third is the transportation and job opportunities that link and uh, think about communities where there's not fresh food access, there's not easy transportation access. It all just crashes in on itself. I had a, a lot of friends um, 
and being around them, getting close to them, getting to know them, um, they had similar things going on in their household um, with uh, poverty issues or um, financial issues, you know, um, I guess you could say like food, um, education, you know, sometimes it could be with uh, clothing, um, you know, everything. So it, we, we kind of related, I, I guess you can say that that's kind of what's like, that was like the base point of everything. That's, you know, you would um, get around those type of kids and you kind of have like similar things going on so you would kind of cling to that and, and that would kind of bring you closer. So. I never actually experienced the, am I going to be okay? Set of fear that was almost in the DNA of the kids that I was dealing with. You know, Washington, D.C. is is fraught with disparities. It's a paradox of sorts. Um, you know, Washington, D.C. ranks high in income, wealth, education, quality of life for many. But Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area in Prince George's County also ranks high for teen pregnancy, uh, homelessness, poverty, et cetera. You have to first go to housing policy and how many years departments of housing and community development, departments of health and departments of the environment saw under-resourced communities of color as intractable problems that they wouldn't invest in, um, did not see the opportunity and went where the tax base was. I don't know everything that went on in their household that caused their circumstances to be what they were. But for myself, um, you know, I guess you could say like not having like a present dad, um, you know, not having a father figure, um, my mom trying to do everything by herself, juggling everything, that can be a lot. Um, and, you know, sometimes that can feel like, um, it can feel like it's not enough as a kid, you know, you don't really know them, you don't have that knowledge, you don't really know what goes on into that, you know, being a parent, um, having a kid and trying to do everything you can to provide for them emotionally financially. Just the stress of it, to think about that, right? Um, and the stress of whether or not the lights will be on, the heat will be on, or I will be here tomorrow. That it is, that's an impossible framework for most people to think about what their success will be just tomorrow morning or the next day or how they get their kids to school. I think anybody can learn a lot from just sitting down listening to people. They're swimming in these waters every day. There's still a lot of uh, people out there that just don't have. But where we have had disinvestment for generations is where it is needed most. But the disparities that have been brought to the forefront from a health standpoint, from a food standpoint, from a quality of life standpoint, cannot be denied. You know, we live in a region that is is uh, an extreme dichotomy, and that's one of the challenges that I think we have. My neighborhood specifically, you know, we've got the wharf that's four blocks away from public housing, right? So we have public housing, and then we have uh, a million dollar a development that's going to have million dollar condominiums and boat slips, you know, all within the same walking distance. So what you have found is the creativity of these marginalized communities. And I use that term loosely because we have our liquor stores who also perform as banks. Because they issue quote unquote money orders. They cash checks. You got convenience stores that serve multiple facets. And so normal amenities that are almost natural in the organic evolution of communities is some of our neighbors are absent. You know, a real healthy market includes everybody. All of the participants have to be healthy. Um, you know, who's going to work at these great establishments where, you know, we have all these great shops? Who's going who's gonna to be involved in servicing all of these types of uh, development? and patronizing these developments and, um, you know, creating the vibrancy that we're looking for and the diversity that we're looking for. So in order for all of it to work, you know, the region is a system and the system is, is essentially closed. 
And so it's only as strong as the weakest link. So we have to work together and bring everybody up to at least a standard that we think is acceptable for um, anyone that lives in the region, given the strengths that we have. There's no reason to tout any strengths when we have people living in poverty and we have homeless people and we have people that can't have access to those strengths. Just because you are very low income and uh, or you're you know in a in a moment of that, that doesn't mean you don't want the coffee shop and the hardware store and the nice park. And in fact, you need it more. And so I think the real work is going to be you know how we balance these things out. Hello, my name is Aiden, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about Marion Barry. Marion Barry was an American politician. In the 1960s, he was involved in the Civil Rights Movement, and he served as mayor in D.C. from 1979 to 1991, and again in office from 1995 to 1999. Barry was a popular, positive, and amazing influence in D.C. When Barry was in office, the rise of black ownership skyrocketed. Also, the unemployment rate decreased as black business owners and the government hired all classes of DC residents. Barry really wanted to impact finances and the well being of DC. Later in 1985, he started the first summer youth program, hiring over 25,000 teenagers. The Washington Post once said, If you want to understand DC, you must understand Mary and Barry. Thank you, Mary and Barry, for being our diamond in the district. Look at Washington 30 years ago, look at Washington today. I worry that it is a place that if you are lower income, that you can really find housing and stability because wealth has kind of overtaken a lot of neighborhoods. Not only from uh, home ownership, but from business ownership. Um, historically, you know, we never had the same access to money. Uh, that others have, and because of that, you know, we had to, you know, generate it on our own, which takes time, and, and everybody, you know, doesn't have that ability. We've had businesses that have been operating for years. They're tremendous uh, tacticians in what they do, but they are winners. They don't own the land, but they have been operating so long, they've already paid for the building. You, you can have excellent idea, but if you don't, don't have access to the resources that can help you develop it, then you know you're, you're limited. So it's the same thing like if you had that house and somebody offers you that money, or I'll say like with the business, uh, somebody else comes to the owner with a better business proposition or more money, what do you think the owner gonna do? If you look at the number of CBEs and the number of people actually getting work, there's a disconnect. And that disconnect is fundamentally also driven by ethnic considerations. Because once again, access to capital becomes a key component. Hi, I'm Erin and I want to teach you a little bit about Industrial Bank. Industrial Bank is a black owned bank in DC and Maryland. In 1913, Industrial Bank was founded by Jesse Mitchell. After his death in 1955, his son Dole took over. Jesse and Dole, thank you for being the diamond in the district. Uh, it appears that uh, Black America is just settling for what they had. You know, that's not going to make it. Targeted at the root, right? We have to. We have to increase educational capacity. We have to increase vision for people. It's very difficult to encourage people if instinctively they understand that they don't have access to the things that we want them to have access to or that they could have access to. And so where the vision's been stymied, there's no reason for anyone to put energy into uh, of progress and doing the things they need to do if we can't guarantee that they can get there or at least have a fair shot at getting there. So when we start talking about how do we begin to address, uh, you know, this whole notion of healthy,
communities, then we have to start with what is the composition of the assets that make up these communities? And how do we strategically and intentionally begin to reposition and reimagine how we bring these services to our community so that we can live, we can entertain, we can enjoy in our community. We don't have to keep going outside of our community. We can then begin to attract those other amenities that make communities wholesome and stable. Hey, everybody wants a better neighborhood. Everyone is entitled to exactly what they believe they should have. And they should be willing to do what is necessary to make it happen. It's not going to happen for you. You do have to do it yourself. You don't have to do it by yourself. So we have to now be intentional and purposeful about how do we begin to mitigate this gap. How do we begin to make sure that communities that have historically been marginalized, communities who have assets that have been underutilized in terms of its contribution to the quality of life of its residents and to the city, does not, does not fail to produce until the community change. One thing that I believe in my heart is that we can make a difference without the difference being total gentrification. Everybody wants things to be better. It's just that we need to do that with everyone, right? And so how do we then become more collaborative? And one of the things that I'm hoping that we learn from this experience, and I think this experience that just that we're just coming out of, or we're still experiencing now called this pandemic, has, has, has laid bare all of the anecdotal things that we kind of knew and some of us didn't want to talk about because it's really heartbreaking. It's in a race, we're like 60, 70 years behind everyone else because of redlining, because of land stolen, because of forced uh, removal. And so the only way to really right those wrongs is politically and with government action. Um, we can't do it alone, you know, some, like I said, people who do slip through the cracks, for every one of us who do slip through the cracks, it's like a hundred who didn't. So the odds are theoretically against us no matter what. And we have to speak the truth about that. Um, as I've gone around the city, um, what I've noticed is going up are a lot of high rise buildings and blocks. They're all clustered around metros. And so all these apartments are going anywhere from starting off at $2,200 for a studio. So coming out of high school, coming out of college, how can someone really afford to live in a $2,200 studio? Okay, your parents or your grandparents sold the house in DC, so you can't really come back to DC. So you either have to stay outside of the city and so I just see DC within the next 20 years just becoming a playground for um, the upper middle class and the wealthy. Um, these are the only people who are gonna be able to afford these, these places um, because they're getting rid of the low income housing, they're coming up with everything that's being built on a metro or near public transportation is at a premium cost and the houses are gonna be at least six, seven hundred thousand so you can't if you don't have the resources or somebody who already left you something in the city, it's going to be extremely hard to get a foothold to build wealth in terms of home ownership. I do plan to own a home someday in DC, um, but I know that's can seem a little far fetched sometimes. Uh, DC is really expensive, and I know there's a lot that goes into that, but just making sure that I have the financial leverage. I just wish that all the people in, in the Washington DC area um, was able to stay in their homes and keep their homes. So what I would like to see more of is the uh, organizations working together. I really, I think, and it, it is probably high hopes, but I think as a people, say we need to focus on education. It needs to be that critical 
from the black universities on down to the organizations. We got to undo what was done to us over all these years. Nobody wants to step up and say, oh, what are you doing? You know, so I think that's a big problem. I mean, when I was when I was growing up, we had we had uh, role models like that. Whether it was in the home, whether it was your father, even if it was in the street, you had role models that were like, uh, what you doing out here? Like how kids are just out here on the corner all day, all night, all times of night. It, it really wasn't no such thing as that back then. Because somebody was going to say something. Somebody was going to say something. They was going to tell on you, or if they didn't grab you and, and, and to chase you in they, on their own. You know, we've been brainwashed. We got to start loving ourselves. I think it's just like everybody has to be. Our people, black people, we, we just have to be one. If we don't uh, make our advances for ourselves, everything that we have or have achieved would probably be diminished or taken away from us. And so how do we begin to change that thinking? How do we begin to get ourselves to the point that we have to collectively understand that if it's our objective to begin to mitigate the gap between the groups around this whole notion of wealth and opportunities, then we have to be very intentional and purposeful about it. I think the education just be a, has to be at the forefront. It's, it's, it's a desperate mode, man. Even if we buy a property and I know I can sell it for way more, I would just rather rent it out and hold on to it and use the equity somehow, somewhere else. If we went and invested in the hardest hit housing in the most under-resourced communities and we actually lifted people up to par, what would it mean? People who are black and brown have the same and if not a preferred consideration to help break this divide. See, we're not gonna ever, if we if we look projectively out, we're not gonna ever be equal organically. There's gotta be some intentional stuff that's introduced here to make it happen. With the emergence of the new hospital, and we've already started dialogue, uh, we want to make sure that uh, that hospital is cr cr uh, created and constructed by black people. Um, and that and once it's up and then the black people are employed there, <clears throat> and any uh, uh, vendors that come through there, there's black vendors. I mean, we could even take the initiative to create a cooperative uh, laundromat, a commercial laundromat in, in uh, the St. Elizabeth Project, and, and contract with the hospital that that laundromat uh, provides all the linen for, uh, all the laundry for that. And, and, and even with Homeland Security, you know, create those kind of contracts, which then allows the residents to have employment and even have ownership in, in the business, and that's how you generate wealth. I've been able to establish a fitness company that's the largest fitness and massage therapy company for individuals with developmental disabilities in the district. Um, we've been able to hire about um, 10 to 12 district employees as contractors, as fitness and massage therapists. We've been able to, since we've been in business, probably um, put close to almost $2 million into their pockets as DC residents. Um, so I think that's been pretty good. It's, it feels good to be able to employ individuals and see them buy homes and cars and, and improve on themselves. So um, that's a priceless feeling. Uh, but we can, we need more entrepreneurs. We need people who are willing to take the risk and, and, and buy things and, and invest in things that are connected back to the community. So we want to take full advantage of the, the uh, free enterprise system. You know, uh, as limited as capitalism is, is, it is a system we're in now. So we need to use it. We need to uh, uh, build wealth just like they do through that mechanism. Um, and we need to, as a community, see ourselves as developers. There's no reason why 
uh, we can't either use one of the existing community development corporations or create a new one, whatever makes sense, and, and become very aggressive in developing the community. When I had four and a half acres of land, I plan to leave four and a half acres of land to my kids and my oldest granddaughter. Um, I'm an investor and owner in Washington, D.C. properties. Um, have several condos in the Southeast Berry Farms area. Um, also bought some property over on Georgia Avenue near Howard University. Um, our plan is when we buy property in DC, we don't plan on selling. So that's why, like even now with my um, siblings, I'm telling them, though, you can't be so anxious to sell. Because once you sell, it's gone. I think having a strong foothold in Washington, D.C., owning real estate, typically for African-Americans, um, that should be a priority. These are some of the things that we have to start focusing on the education, focusing on, on owning, ownership, you know, even without, without black businesses. Working to remove archaic barriers and legal structures and land use structures and um, you know, licensing and permitting. There's a lot of things that are just basic hindrances to people who are um, doing good work to try to progress the stature and the status of people who have not been given the opportunities that everyone else has been given. Um, and so for the developers that are coming in Ward 8 to make money, uh, the opportunity for them is to invest through a community benefit agreement. If they can just give uh, 40 acres in the mule, that, that could be a start too. You know, 40, 40 acres in the, in the Cadillac. So, you know. <laughs> but um, um, the thing is, um, you got to start somewhere. But I feel that um, giving us some, some uh, property well, you know, any, any property is available, we need to capture at, at least um, as much ownership of it. Uh, we do have a, a, a land trust uh, that is in place that can be helpful with that, and maybe we can expand that. We've uh, really started the uh, bigger movement on getting nonprofit hospitals to write large checks, uh, not just support a community fair, but one of our hospitals is putting $50 million into lead poisoning prevention, cash. Well, you got this money and the data shows it needs to go here. Into the community investment fund for the sole purpose of them giving back to the community. We can get other institutional investors in, you know, banks who have done a very poor job of investing in the community, uh, universities. And it's thinking out the box. Um, I, I would like for us to create in Ward 8 a World Trade Center. It's like a sign that we put out that uh, people in Ward 8 want to do trade with the world. That if you're an African country and, and you're trying to figure out how to do trade uh, with uh, African Americans, you can come to Ward 8 and we'll, we'll be a broker for those types of connections. Well, I've had some real uh, conversations with um, individuals from Africa who have resources and would like to invest in the United States uh, what better way to, for them to invest in a, a black community in Washington, D.C. Uh, that they could have ownership in? The good news is the opportunity for jobs and communities to solve this that are higher paying than normal contractor jobs. Teaching young people about data and about risk assessment and getting jobs that start at fifty-five dollars to $80,000 a year that, to do that work. Owning the data of community so that it's used properly and for good and for mapping of where investments need to go. So uh, moving forward, uh, that's gonna be how we measure uh, the community, the well-being of the community by uh, the wealth uh, and well-being of, of the residents. I'm a little bit encouraged that the business community has started to turn the corner and realize this. It still takes some time for this to become um, a reality and the mechanisms and the vehicles to take place that um, provide the business community access to solutions and to be able to, to to work with the agencies and the groups that have been at this for a long time. But I think the awareness is a big step. 
I think the awareness and acceptance that the region is a, a, a system that works best when we're all closer to parity is, um, is a huge, huge win. And that's a lot of that's taken place over the last couple of years. Even if the powers that be don't do what we need them to do because they're in control, we have to find our way in somehow or another to fix things ourselves. And I think we have the power to do it. We just have to decide to make it happen. But let's just get down to the nuts and bolts and dig in. But that takes listening. That takes spending time with people, understanding that there are barriers, that everything is not about individual initiative alone, that there are structural system and systematic issues that uh, have to be addressed. We um, have the ability to, to go anywhere in the world and do whatever we want to do. And so um, we just have to find that for ourselves. And if we can spend the time listening and then commit to deadline problem solving, which is to say, let's give ourselves 90 days to fix this. And whatever the best solution is in 90 days, let's implement it. And, and let's, let's do that. Let's get the buy-in from the top, whether that's the mayor, the city council, whoever. But let's say, let's, let's solve 10 problems this year immediately. And let's not get, let it get into sucked into the vortex of bureaucracy, but let's put action to the front and let's take action. And if we're wrong, we can make an adjustment. We cannot continue these conversations into the next decade. We have to consider major actions toward equity now. So yes, buy from Blacks and other minoritized businesses. And don't stop there. Be a customer. Be a repeat customer. Yes, hire Black people and people of color to work in your business. But don't stop there. Hire them in executive positions. Yes, sell to Black and other minoritized people groups. But don't stop there. Sell them assets so they can obtain an equity nest egg long term for themselves and their posterity. So how might you help close this wealth gap?